The regular meeting of the Town of Superior Board of Trustees for Monday, June 10th, 2019. Could we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Clint Folsom. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Mark Laces. Here. Uh, Trustee Sandy, Sandy Hammerway. Here. Ken Lish. Here. Kevin Ryan. Here. Neil Shaw. Here. Boris Kuczynski. Here. Town Manager Matt Magley. Here. Town, Town Attorney Kendra Carberry. Town Here. Town Clerk Sorry. Sorry. Thanks. Next is the approval of the agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda or other places on the agenda the board would like to make changes to? I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, motion by Trustee Ryan, second by Mayor Pro Tem Lasis. All those in favor? All right, good. We're back to unanimous on the agenda. That's good. I almost All right, good. A little, little humor from last month's or last meeting. All right, next is reports, questions, and issues. Uh, I'd like to start. Kevin. Good evening. Uh, a couple meetings from last week. Uh, we held on Monday, June 2nd, the 3rd, thank you, the now bi-monthly traffic and safety committee meeting. Uh, that's, so that's every other month instead of uh, every quarter. Um, Lots of positive discussion and good to see so much improved process for re receiving suggestions from the community. We always had a policy in place, but uh, we've now simplified that policy and put it all on one page. Um, of note, we discussed the speed limit on South Cold Creek Drive uh, to supplement the planned pedestrian enhancements. The suggestion from the TSC was to reduce the speed limit to 25 miles an hour. Since this is not a material change or required monetary commitment, this seems like something we could have done at TSC, but before doing so, I wanted to take the pulse of the board for your support, so maybe as folks are making comments, I'll say it again, looking for board directional support for reducing south, the speed limit on South Cold Creek to 25 miles an hour um, during your comments. Um, not only will this potentially create a safer street, but this would provide an important data point, which is, Will a posted reduction in speed limit actually reduce speed? Um, because the traffic science it tells us that people, for the most part, will drive the speed they feel is safe based upon street design and weather conditions. But we have some other important decisions to make around speed and speed limits in this town. So this is a quarter mile stretch of road. And I think the town attorney is going to tell me that because it's a connector, I'm somehow restricted. No, I'm not saying that we're restricted because we need, there's a process we have to follow. Okay, well, hold your tongue on it. And okay, got it. Maybe if somebody wants to, to give a pulse check and then we'll, we'll follow up on that process. Um, because if there's directional support, then I guess we could loop back on the correct process. Thank you for that, Kendra. Um, we also held a lengthy discussion around pedestrian safety improvements on 76 and Sycamore, um, which are pretty, it's got a, it's, it's pretty exciting. and doing some smart things around bulb outs and uh, going to very much improve that that uh, intersection, which is in need for improvement given the, the location of the park and the bus stop. And finally, we have initiated a study on potential traffic mitigation for Rock Creek Parkway. Now, we were fairly warned that since this is such a highly trafficked road, this will take some time and will require a lot of community engagement. But the suggestion from a few weeks ago of, hey, could we just reduce the speed? Could we make it a single lane? This is going to take quite a bit of time to uh, think through. And again, because it's such a highly trafficked road, it's going to be, it's going to take some time and engagement from the community. On Wednesday, which would have been June 4th, I think if I have that correct, I was honored to be invited to the Superior Youth Leadership Council this is such an impressive group of young people who do so much for the community. Uh, amazingly, they have nine, nine graduating members this, this year, and so that recruiting process has already started. So if you, watching at home, because I know the kids love watching this at home, uh, 
um, are interested or maybe a member of your family is interested in the Superior Youth Leadership Council, um, please watch our website for additional information or you could email uh, anybody on the board or Kevin Colon uh, from town staff. And I think that's all I have. Oh, and a final announcement. Uh, what a lot of people do not know, Superior has uh, its own curling league at the sports table. And um, I'm a champion, curler. So we won uh, our curling competition. Uh, it's really back, it is backyard curling. It's, in, it's I meant to bring a trophy. It's a really big trophy and a hat. I was, really, I was super excited about it. Um, it's backyard curling. It's a ton of fun. You do not have to have any experience or know the rules. It's Friday night, so, and you could go on the Sports Table website and navigate to it. The next season starts in a couple weeks, and hopefully I'll see it out there uh, on the ice. There should be some curling term I should know, but whatever. Anyway, thank you. All right, so first on uh, Saturday, June 2nd, I had the opportunity to attend National Trails Day, and I want to just really say congratulations to OSAC for a fantastic job hosting their sixth annual event. I hosted guests from Switzerland at the event, and kids and adults alike really loved the activities. I'm eager for us to have more annual events like this in Superior to bring the community together, and also that we can bring guests from outside the community to and show them why Superior is such a wonderful place to live. As, um, as Kevin stated, I won't go over what we covered at the Transportation and Safety Committee meeting, um, but I do support uh, lowering the speed limit on Coal Creek Drive to 25 miles per hour. I think it would be a great experiment to see what happens if we lower the post speed limit without any actual traffic calming measures. Um, some people might just keep speeding right on by and others might slow down, but I think, that, I think that's a cheap experiment. We can try and see how that might help. Um, this Friday, June 7th, um, I co-hosted First Friday along with Trustee Sandy Hammerly over at Sticks Coffee in Superior Town Center. The topics that we covered included the Coal Creek Crossing field landscaping issues, delays in the roundabout art installation due to footing issues, standing water in original town due to construction, and the Riverbend um, and Zone 3 public engagement process, construction blocking the sidewalks and bike lanes on 88th Street, and the ever popular topic of Rocky Mountain Municipal Airport noise, um, statues around town being defaced with clothing, and the water treatment plant smell, and finally a budget overage on the Coal Creek enhancements. Um, I know that those meetings aren't publicized, so I hope it is helpful to at least hear an overview of what we talked about. Finally, over the last couple weeks, I've had several meetings with residents to discuss the Zone 3 park public engagement process. Um, in all, I have heard a lot of opposition to locating a playground at Riverbend Park specifically, and I also haven't yet heard clear support from residents who are asking for there to be a park in Zone 3. We're still awaiting the final results of the survey that was sent to residents, but since the board won't be meeting again between when the final results come out and the ProStack meeting and the 4th of July, which is when we plan to do that next round of public engagement, I'd like to ask the board whether we would consider informally providing direction to not uh, go forward with the planned public engagement at the 4th of July Pancake Festival. If the survey results do warrant moving forward to public engagement, we could certainly do that on a later date at the Fall Chili Fest, but right now this is definitely a very contentious issue, and I don't see the need to proceed on July 4th, especially um, especially since I don't, I don't think we have those survey results back yet. Okay, thanks, Laura. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'll start with the Zone 3 Park since Laura uh, brought it up. Uh, I too have been meeting with several residents, uh, mostly against having a playground uh, in the area of Riverbend Park. Uh, I think we've heard a lot of really good comments uh, supporting that position and, and fully understand and agree with that. Um, I've also been hearing from and meeting with residents who uh, on the opposite side, you are still looking for a park or a playground in Zone 3. Uh, so I would not be supportive of giving ProStack any deviated uh, direction from what they've already been given and approved. Um, but what I was consistently hearing is that the Riverbend area was engaged really well because this was clearly in their backyards and important, but the people most affected or impacted by this, the folks in the Stoneham areas, the Amherst areas, 
uh, well, Dona, we're not necessarily hearing all of this and aware of all of this. Uh, as such, I took additional steps and uh, went door to door uh, and trying to talk to people to make sure they were aware of this, making sure they're aware of the survey and dropping flyers if I couldn't talk to people. Uh, but hopefully we, we've gotten to enough people that we can have a good survey result. Um, National Trails Day I also attended, and I'd like to say great job to uh, OSAC. It was another great event, and I'm glad I could actually participate this year rather than working the event uh, like the last five years. Um, in uh, relation to National Trails Day, uh, I spoke with a resident there and then uh, also received a email from a different resident uh, with concern about our lack of and diminishing soft trails within our community. Uh, we are expanding our trail footprint, but all of it is hard, uh, hard surface trails, uh, which are uh, much harder on runners, uh, which I'm sure Laura probably has too. Um, anyway, uh, one of them brought up a, uh, a great program that Golden was uh, working on. They were calling it single track sidewalks. Uh, to oversimplify it, they were adding a uh, parallel soft surface trail right next to hard surfaces to give uh, people the option of what they prefer to use and the goal was to hopefully remove barriers to uh, getting people outside to recreate so I think this would be a great uh, thing for us to look into and would hope to uh, have OSAC add this to OSAC and or ProStack add this to their work plans for next year uh, I won't steal Mark's thunder, but uh, at the Rocky Flat Stewardship Council, I'll say Mark uh, took a very strong leadership position in the face of opposition and has done great work to uh, preserve the health and safety of uh, not just superior residents, but the residents of our entire region. Uh, and then finally, uh, I attended the Boulder County Consortium of Cities uh, this past Wednesday. Uh, among several items discussed uh, was the Rocky Mountain uh, Metropolitan Airport, and Boulder County is ready to lend support to Superior and Louisville's efforts on this regard, and before taking additional action, uh, we'll wait until the final results from our consultants come forward with the solutions that they've identified and what impact and effect those will have, and will then work with us accordingly uh, to identify what role they can play in this, uh, but they, they were there and ready for support. Uh, and then finally, I would be in support of a reduction in speed on poultry drive. Good, thanks, Ken. Sandy? Thank you. Um, I, I too attended the Zone 3 playground meeting on June 1st. I stayed the entire time and I really appreciate the time uh, that the residents of the area um, spent with me and other members of the board and particularly the representatives of town staff and uh, pro staff who were there. It was really valuable to be able to um, kind of live with the park for a little while. I, I don't live in that part of town, so to be able to experience it um, and to understand the perspective of those who live in the area. I continue to stand by my earlier statement that the town needs to think long and hard before disrupting parks and other open space that have been in place for decades and previously approved. Uh, I also attended National Trails Day activities on June 2nd at the Colton Trailhead. I want to apologize to residents who attended to take the wagon ride. Um, unfortunately, the wagon folks uh, had a breakdown and they did not get here. It was a big hit when we did it last year. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, do that at another activity in town, but um, we were unable to, to deliver on that. Um, I attended the Superior Chamber of Awards dinner on June 4th. Um, there were a number of awards given out, but three in particular were given to um, volunteers um, who have, uh, or folks who, uh, for their contributions to the town of Superior in particular. Um, the Business of the Year, Guardian Storage, uh, was recognized for, uh, among the things for their partnership with the town on shredding of documents and hard to recycle events. The Superior Volunteer of the Year was Tory Powers, who uh, was recognized for his tremendous efforts to help us improve the bike park at Autry Park 
and to really spearhead the Rod Autry project. And most notably, uh, Heather Craycraft, the former uh, executive director of the Superior Chamber of Commerce, was named uh, the winner of the Superior Achievement Award. The most exciting part of, of uh, the recognition that uh, Heather has given to the Chamber for 12 years, they have renamed the award the Heather Craycraft Superior Achiever Award, and it will be named that uh, for perpetuity. Other award re recipients included Education Educator of the Year, Elaine Hewitt for her work with um, and advocating for children with dyslexia, the Young Professional of the Award, Young Professional of the Year, which is one of the newer awards, to Brittany Hunter with Dynamic Healing LLC for her efforts to reduce the stigma that surrounds mental health, the Independent Business of the Year, the Rock Creek Veterinary Hospital, the Business Professional of the Year, Heidi Howard of Heidi Howard Photography, and finally, the Service Organization of the Year, Realities for Children in Boulder County. I also uh, attended the Superior Le Youth Leadership Council meeting on June 5th. Um, those kids are out doing so many things in our community, and I continue to be impressed by all the things they're doing to make uh, our programs in Suc Superior successful. I think they said they actually have 11 graduating seniors. So there's not only nine spots, there's 11. They will be hosting an event, uh, I believe they were looking at August after the kids go back to school to recruit new members. So if you have a young person who might be interested, um, it is really a great group of kids. They're, you know, we've got folks from all different parts of town. Um, on June 6th, I played my first ever game of pickleball at Wildflower Park. Um, if you knew how unathletic I am, you would know. But um, it was a great experience to, uh, to see the sport in action. Um, my sense is that we have a small group of enthusiasts in town, but I'd really like to have a better sense of how many folks are really interested um, as one of those senior types, um, I can understand why it's very attractive to older folks. I happen to be playing with some much younger folks. So um, fortunately, they were way better than me. Um, as uh, Laura mentioned, uh, I co-hosted First Friday on June 7th. Um, one of the topics that was discussed rather um, for quite a while was a frustration with 88th Street. and. What a mess it is and i would really like um matt if you could during your report to give the uh, town a bit of a report on the progress with the excel um, undergrounding and when we think we'll actually be able to do some of the resurfacing to make that at least temporarily a better road for our folks to drive on um, the last two things i want to remind everybody that um, June 26th is Bike to Work Day, and I encourage everybody to consider riding their bikes to work. Um, the Town of Superior will have a station on the uh, bike trail at Cole Creek, and at the Cole Creek Trail, and um, it's a great opportunity to get out and go to work a different way. And then finally, just for my fellow trustees, I will not be able to um, host the uh, first Fridays on August 2nd, um, and I would appreciate it if somebody would step up and, and join with Laura in covering that for us. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andy. Neil? Thanks. Um, just, I don't want to, it looks like a lot of us overlap with a number of different meetings this past couple weeks, so I'll try to hit this quickly. Um, I also attended the ProStack Community Engagement <laughs> Zone 3. Um, for discussing a park amenity on June 1st. I really want to thank ProStack and staff for putting a great event together. Um, however, to Laura's question, I actually think I want to continue the process as laid out by ProStack. I don't want to circumvent the plan course of action that ProStack has laid out. We may not like how the, we may not, we may feel a specific passion towards a direction, but it's not complete. And you know, we rely on our citizen community uh, committees to sort of give us direction. So I want to let that proceed as planned. Um, I also attended the National Trails Day on June 2nd. Thanks to OSAC for a great event that helped me rem help to remind me of the subtle differences between rattlesnakes and bull snakes, aside from the obvious rattle. Um, now, the TSC held their meeting this past 
uh, Monday on June 3rd, as Trustee Ryan alluded to, um, specifically the Cold Creek speed limit of 25 miles per hour. So I'm a huge fan of this. Um, it turns out it's the only connector street in Superior at 35 miles per hour. Uh, on the south side of that same street, the south side of Rock Creek Parkway, it's 25 miles per hour. Alex Arnello had to go back to the PUD to understand how it even ended up at 35. The original plan for Cold Creek Drive was a four lane road that would have connected back to its original town. And since that plan was changed, Cold Creek Drive has, has since been restriped to just two lanes with really wide shoulders. Um, that said, the continuation of Cold Creek Drive North into Lanterns was approved at 25 miles per hour as part of the Boulder Creek FDP last year. So we actually approved a street to connect, you know, to, rather connect the neighborhood at 25 miles an hour to a street that was already at 35 miles an hour with the sidewalk kind of bifurcating the two of them. So this reduction to 25 just kind of smooths it out. I also want to clarify that we are actually going to be putting in some traffic calming measures. Um, the installation of a crossing refuge near Akron is going to be going in. Mainly this was community led to assist kids with uh, crossing with the bus drop offs. BVSD drops their kids off on, on uh, Cole Creek Drive and a lot of parents were concerned given the traffic and the speeds about crossing. So. Um, TSC, Alex, as well as with the consultant, put together a great design of a refuge that's going to get in, put in this summer. Um, so I think I'm woefully in support of 25 miles per hour. If anything, I ask myself, why couldn't this have been done 10 years ago when we restriped it? Um, that's everything I got. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Mark? Okay, good evening. And I just, can I, I, I'm good on the 25 mile. So I forgot to do that. Good evening. Um, and thanks, Neil, for, for that additional information. I, one of the questions that I had with respect to Cole Creek was, you know, what did the data show and, you know, what was kind of the rationale behind TSC's recommendation? I think the inconsistency between a 35 feet and a 25 mile an hour zone um, seems like it was an, an oversight. And, you know, if this is a, a quick fix and it's going to make it safer, um, especially given the fact that we've got kids crossing there for uh, uh, the school bus, um, yeah, I'd be. But I would just defer generally to the TSC who's thinking you know, long and hard about these issues. Um, and with respect to the Riverbed Parks um, and the 4th of July community engagement, um, I think we've had this discussion now for several months, and I think it's important to continue to go forward at the 4th of July with outreach to the community that we're discussing the concept of you know, maybe some park amenities in the greater Zone 3 area without necessarily focusing it as this is a Riverbend Park amenity. This is, you know, to Ken's point, you know, maybe this would be something uh, more towards, uh, you know, the Lanterns Lane development that the uh, Akron and Weldona folks um, can ha have a voice in that decision. So I think we just need to be cautious in terms of how we go forward with the outreach at the 4th of July. I would just caution that we don't sell it as this is the Riverbend Park's proposal and this is what we're doing, more as how does the community feel about park amenities in this area? Is anything needed? And if something is needed, then where would you suggest it would go? And then I think if we kind of frame it that way, we'll alleviate some of the concern from the residents who live in the area that are thinking all of a sudden we're disturbing an already existing park. Because I think to Sandy's point, um, we owe it to our residents to honor the way the town has developed and people have relied on the way it, it has come to mature. Um, and it's really uh, you know, disrespectful and disruptive to all of a sudden uh, change what people have grown to love about their backyards. Um, with respect to National Trails Day, I want to echo what everybody said. Uh, OSAC did a fantastic job, but so did the Superior Youth Leadership Committee. Because they were there, and they were giving out um, uh, pots and soil with wildflowers and my kids went there and got some uh, wildflowers and they're already sprouting so they're really excited about that and it was just a really great event I uh, really appreciate all the work that OSAC and Superior, Superior Youth, Youth Leadership uh, Committee did um, on Monday June 3rd uh, Trustee Lish alluded to this uh, Superior presented a motion at the Rocky Platte Stewardship Council oppo opposing oil and gas development and fracking uh, on and under the Rocky Flats site uh, this is a motion that has taken several months to get fully considered, uh, but fortunately, uh, we passed the motion unanimously uh, with one abstention. And uh, you know, this was really uh, a showing of solidarity amongst the communities that this wasn't a anti oil and gas measure. This was a specific measure related to oil and gas development at a very specific site. It is a super fun site that is contaminated with plutonium. 
Um, so I appreciate everybody's support here on the board for that motion and for all the members of the Stewardship Council for getting behind us. Uh, hopefully this motion will raise the awareness, um, refresh people's memories about uh, what the legacy is of Rocky Flats site and that when a proposal comes in the future to develop oil and gas resources or frack on or under Rocky Flats or even near Rocky Flats, that this motion will serve as a refresher of the dangers and a deterrent for any development there. Um, also related to Rocky Flats, on June 25th, June 18th, I'm sorry, at the Broomfield City Council meeting, they'll be hosting their second study session on their decision as to whether or not to fund a $2.5 million uh, uh, contribution to Jefferson Parkway. Uh, we're still waiting on whether or not CDPAG is going to show up and uh, take a position one way or the other on uh, the Jefferson Parkway as a whole, uh, but keep that on your on your calendars. Uh, so June 18th, Broomfield City Council. It'll be a study session, so they won't be taking a vote, but they'll have a possible vote then probably the week following on, on June 25th. So I'll be uh, I'll be following that, and I'll let everybody know what the schedule is for the Broomfield. But that's what I've got. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark. Last Tuesday, I attended the Superior Chamber of Commerce Awards Banquet and appreciate Sandy's recap of the award winners. That was their largest attendance ever. And it was great to see representatives from the surrounding communities, Chamber of Commerce attend as well. And I just have great regional collaboration with, uh, with all these um, different chambers and members from around the surrounding communities as well. Regarding uh, Riverbend Area 3 park ideas, I agree with Mark and Sandy's comments and would um, concur with those. Coal Creek Drive, supportive of the 25 mile an hour idea, assuming that we follow proper process for, for doing so. A couple of upcoming announcements. Next Monday, the 17th of June, 5.30 p.m., we're having a special meeting here at Town Hall to discuss downtown Superior plans. And then, reminder, there's no second regular board meeting in June, so the June 24th meeting is canceled. Our next regular board meeting will be July 8th, which will be after our July 4th celebration, which is a parade, a little downhill mile parade and pancake breakfast. So it's typically our second busiest event of the year in Superior. Um, so I encourage everyone to come out for the events on July 4th. And that is it for my announcements. Matt. Thank you. Uh, with regard to 88th Street that Trustee Henry um, brought up, uh, Excel Energy is close to finishing their work um, to underground power lines off along 88th Street there. The uh, wire's been installed and connected, um, uh, and, and the switch, that'll be happening in the next two weeks, those things. Um, and once that's done, they'll be able to energize the lines and take down the old wire and poles and wrap that project up. Uh, well, don't enclosure, the bollards were not delivered last week as we were promised. So uh, that project's done except for installing the bollards. Once the bollards are installed, we can remove the barriers and all that. Uh, the cell work happened on the southbound lanes of 88. That's where you see the flash fill that was um, poured in the holes that they used for the conduit. Once um, they wrapped up their project, then we'll go back and have a patch done where those holes were, were dug, but there's no other plans for 88th Street this year as far as the length. Of the road. Now, there might be some crack filling and those type of things that we do, but until next year, we're just gonna have to patch and, and band-aid that road. <coughs> do you think it'll be done, all of it, by the 1st of August? Oh, yeah. Okay, I just want to, yep. folks were just very frustrated yeah. and I, like I just want to give them some, yeah, some sure. sense on when we would have the patches done. And it'll be staff's recommendation regardless of what happens on Zaharias that we do something with that road next year. So that'll be our recommendation Okay, Kendra? Nothing, thank you. Phyllis? Yep. All right, very good. Okay, we're on to public comment now. If you'd like to make public comment, just give a little wave. I'll signal you to come up. If you limit or start with your name and address and then limit your comments to five minutes. Appreciate it. Gladys, you're up.
Gladys, 4404 South Third Avenue. Kevin, you're disgusting chomping in the microphone at a meeting. Oh, sorry. You're being paid by my tax dollars. I'm a resident of the town of Superior. You're making a very disgraceful present. I have two items. Second Avenue, the original town. Yes, we had some repairs. There's a crevice down there now that's 17 inches wide, 17 inches long. Foot and a half, or not a foot and a half, an inch and a half deep in one spot. Now, you were elected by the people, the six town board members, you were elected by the people, for the people. This developer has come into town and he is running shit ass over you. Now you are not doing anything for the residents of South Edition of Original Town. There is no reason why that street cannot be completely re-blacktopped after they've torn it up. I understand, I'm from the country, but I understand that they had to cut those streets in order to get their sewer and water and whatever it was that they put in. But there is no reason for it to be left the way that it has been. You have allowed the developers to come into town and rule you instead of you controlling them. There's a good way for them not to get anything done, donation building permits, until they fix that street. Now they have raised that street at the bridge at least four or five inches with that concrete that they've poured in there. The man that lives on the west side of that street right there, he is going to have a huge puddle from that drainage because there's no place for that drainage to go. It's gonna sit right there in front of his mailbox, in front of his car, because there's no drainage there from them raising that street. Now there is no reason why that cannot be re -blacktop. Absolutely none. As far as Alex A's explanation, oh, not until after the project's completely finished. God damn it, that's gonna be years before that project is done. By that time, we're gonna be ready for a second oiling, second block topping. You, as town board members, need to take care of the citizens of the town of Superior, and that is taking care of Second Avenue. The other thing that I want to know is, I want to know if there is a code, ordinance, regulation, resolution, whatever terminology you want to use, regarding secondary residences on primary residence property. We will need to get more information from you and get, well, staff will get back to you on that. It's very clear. Do you allow a second residence okay. on a primary well, residence? This is it's not, very clear This is that. not question and answer, okay? Fine, I make... have an open records request that I expect That's to fine. have that answered. All right, additional public comment? Hi, Sonia Critton, 685 East Wigan Street. I know you guys are used to me coming up here and complaining about $151 million in TIF to the California developers or a Tesla pretend dealership. Um, but I'm actually here to talk about something really fun tonight. Um, the fastest growing sport in the United States is pickleball. Um, in order to play indoors, I do create revenue for the town of Louisville because I joined so I can play over in Louisville. I also am creating some uh, revenue for impact sports and so to all of my peers. I was told by one of you trustees that I should get petitions. So in one day of playing, 24 hours, I have 50 signatures for you of people, and they are not all from Superior. A lot of them are from Boulder, and they've all said if they come here and play pickleball, they're gonna go to Costco, they're gonna shop, they're gonna, you know, exactly the same argument we made when we put in the ice rinks. You build them, they will come. Um, I know that what we have approved, I believe already, was um, in Autry Park for only four courts. Um, my family owns a house in Las Vegas where we have eight courts. 
We have a place in Grand Lake where there's multiple courts. Um, it is the fastest growing sport in the US. We can't keep up. Rather than just building four courts, um, and speaking with Ian McPherson, who is the um, pro down at Impact, if we could actually do something bigger and better, um, I, would, I would really like to ask for your support to ask ProStack Pro and the staff to make this a priority. And I know that we have the funding, so we're gonna get the money back from the pre-K. Um, and this is something I am seeing from every place I play that grandparents are playing with their grandchildren. This is an all generational sport. And um, thank you so much to all of the trustees who've given it a try. It's addictive. It's a, such a fun sto uh, sport. And it's, um, it's all about uh, sportsmanship. It's about, friend you know, it's about being friendly. And it brings people in from all over the world. And I will tell you, like, I have friends right now in Colorado Springs from all over the world because they have a, a, a clinic down there. And they're staying at the hotels. They're eating at the restaurants. Apex, same thing. When I go down to Apex on Tuesday nights to play, I shop at King Super's down there. I don't shop up here. So we will spend our tax dollars where we play. So I, I just wanted to say, it's the same argument we use with ice rinks. And we do have amazing potential to partner with others and make this uh, you know, really something much bigger and better. My initial thought was coming up here and saying, I'd love the four courts you already approved down at Autry Park. After talking to Ian and realizing the research he's done, I'd like to see 12 courts um, and lights, and I'd like to see this something bigger, and I'd like to partner with others so that it keeps our costs down. And at the end of the day, the only thing I would ask is if superior residents are helping pay for it, we get some sort of small discount. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Additional public comment? Hi, my name is Janet Stroud, and I live on 1104 East Akron. I've met, I've had the pleasure to meet a couple of the trustees in the last couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know this information, but um, when we bought our home last February, but um, I guess uh, Riverbend was up for um, discussion for uh, playground. <clears throat> so at any rate, <clears throat> I understand that there is a need for a playground in zone three, and I'd like other people to understand the, the need for a more um, serene park. I've talked to several people on the phone in the last couple of weeks, and um, I've reached out to the Boulder County Audubon Society. <clears throat> Spoke to the chairperson there. I've also, uh, his name is uh, John Klosterker, Kloster. Uh, I've also spoken to uh, bird rescuing uh, places around town. And I've also talked to a, uh, let's see, Officer, <clears throat> Officer Matt Kochek from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. He is a wildlife biologist, and he and I spoke extensively in regards to River Bend Park. <clears throat> He said that this would be det detrimental if we built any kind of a playground on it. Um, he said it would be the worst case possible, that the migratory birds would not come to this park anymore. Uh, it would be very disruptive, and um, he, he just does not recommend um, an existing park as beautiful as this. Um, with that being said, um, I understand, like I said, there is a need for a uh, play area for young mothers. I too wanted to be a mother as well. Um, <coughs> was pregnant three times, but never was able to have any children. So when we looked for homes last year or the year before that, <coughs> we looked all around Superior and we decided on this particular house with this beautiful view and every evening there's so many pelicans. I've never seen a pelican in middle of America. I've only lived in Southern California and Las Vegas most of my life. So when I see these majestic creatures 
flying in and you could actually hear them when you're in the park landing, um, I would say small children to adults will stop dead on their tracks, watch the pelicans get their free buffet, and then they fly away af after sundown. And it's the most beautiful thing ever. Um, last year I had the privilege for the first time in my life seeing a bluebird, a blue jay, for the very first time, and I screamed as I was doing my dishes. I said to my husband, honey, I see a blue jay. And it's thrilling to see wildlife. And I just think that I understand that there is a need. Can we please roll up our sleeves, go back to the drawing board, or go back to the developers and ask them, listen, you can't have this piece of land without giving us something in return for our residents, for all to enjoy. So if all of you could just please, please, please do that for zone three residents, that would be great because I've spoken to teenager kids, to little kids, and I've asked them all about this park and whether they live near it or live a couple blocks away from it, they've expressed how much they enjoy it. They enjoy the birds, they enjoy the frogs there. And one even expressed to me, he's in seventh grade, he said, I can't wait to get married so that I can have children and my kids could exper experience the same thing that I got to experience. So I just would like you all to please, please roll up your sleeve and tell the developers, listen, you can't have this beautiful park that's been in place for almost 30 years, as old as Ken and Laura <laughs> have been on this earth, right? <laughs> so please, just, just really do the hard work and we'll, we'll be back up, backing you guys up too, now that we know. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment? Hi, my name is Ron Brave, and I live at 211 Sixth Avenue up the street. And I would like to speak for a moment in support of pickleball. Uh, it's wonderful that Sandy got introduced to it, and I know Laura has also. Uh, I, I would like to say that the impact location may be a really nice place for us to think about putting pickleball because it it provides kind of a unique environment where we can have indoor and outdoor opportunities to play. And one of the nice things about having multiple courts is that this sport is really, really growing. And it's not just seniors. And my wife and I uh, 50 years now, <laughs> uh, can qualify as seniors. And we have seen the sport grow in so many dimensions. Our grandkids just love to get out there and hit the ball with us. And guys coming off work in the evening, they love the, the lights and being able to play in great weather in the evening and in the mornings before people head off to work. The middle of the day sometimes gets a little rough around here with this beating sun, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. That's for the younger guys. But there's an interesting thing. Patty is uh, an Alzheimer's coach. And uh, I have the benefit of reading some of the papers, the research papers that she gets from time to time. And one of the papers that I was reading was saying that one of the great things that helps our seniors is exercise. But in particular, exercise that involves eye tracking and motor coordination as a response to that eye tracking. Now, when we were younger, we just took that for granted. We played baseball, we 
played football. We were out there playing tennis. As so we get older, that's just not, <laughs> that's just not in everybody's uh, wheelhouse anymore. But pickleball is, and pickleball fits that perfectly, absolutely perfectly. The other aspect is, is that the social aspect of pickleball is wonderful for the seniors. It's a great sport. It's a social sport. It's a sport that everybody can participate in. And you don't have to be an expert tennis player. You don't have to get out there and feel like you've got to be, you know, beaten up. You can get out there and you can just play the game. It's just an addictive, wonderful game. And I think it would be wonderful for this town of ours to be able to support pickleball. So thank you for your time. And thank you. Additional comments? Charles Stroud, I live at uh, 1104 East Akron Place. Um, I wanted to come up tonight and just express my opposition to the possibility of building a playground, uh, playground amenities at Riverbend. Not in Zone 3, I totally understand and I, and I agree that there probably is a need. Um, but I uh, just want to say, you know, when we were searching for our home in Rock Creek, um, peacefulness and open space like view um, was a requirement for me specifically and my wife. Um, at, the, at the time, um, our current home now of uh, approximately one and a half years, um, it came on the market. There were several other options or similar that, that had the exact footprint or similar that, that we could have purchased um, for much less money. Um, but we chose this home specifically for its location, um, for its calm setting, and the vast amount of wildlife that it offered behind it. Um, I think it'd be a shame to lose something uh, that provides a wonderful break from our fast digital lives. Um, I'm a data architect, by the way, um, for my day job, so I spend a significant amount of my day um, deep in the design of uh, source code of systems. Um, so it's really important to me um, that we have amenities so close to our home to relax our mental health and, and help provide a natural way to decompress from that. Um, every evening, you know, I get the joy of seeing and hearing the vast array of birds um, out there while observing fellow neighborhood dwellers, you know, also sitting and watching, you know, observing all that, that wildlife as well, while they're going on their long walks. Um, so it's, that's pretty much what I wanted to, to say. Thank you. Thanks. Additional public comment? Sasha Stiles, one, uh, 1335 South Mesa Court. Uh, I actually went to the Stewardship Council meeting. I've actually been to the Stewardship Council meetings for years because uh, as an MD and, and, and an MPH, I have a lot to say about the um, medical issues uh, surrounding workers and people that live close to Rocky Flats and the downwind population. And I wanted to say thank you, Mark. <coughs> You guys should have been there. The, what he did is not, the Stewardship Council, Council rarely, rarely passes anything. They talk a lot, and that's okay. Um, but what Mark did was skillfully present everything for probably the 20th time to a bunch of people that have disparate views and was able to thread the needle between the people who were not quite so sure they wanted to support anything and the people that really wanted to support something and was able to knit it all together into a resolution that everyone except for one, one person who actually didn't oppose it, just abstained. And he did it masterfully. And I want to, as a town resident, say I'm really proud of us and especially proud of you and thank you for what you did. Um, it, 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 will, it, was, it was amazing. And one, so then switching gears, you know, as an MD and PH, I've done millions of surveys. In fact, we're doing another downwinder survey right now for uh, uh, illness from uh, the uh, downwind population of Rocky Flats. And 
you guys know this and I won't harbor it much, but what you sent out was not an accurate survey. An accurate survey would have given information on a bunch of locations with uh, commonly weighted issues rather than call it Riverbend Park in four out of, the t out of the nine or 10 questions. You all know that, but as you collect the survey data, I beg you as I would beg my colleagues um, at the universities where I've worked, don't, this survey is just one part. I think you've heard and you were kind enough to come out to meet. Many of you went to um, the Ice Cream Social and even to some of our homes to meet with us and talk about why we love Riverbend Park the way it is. And I want to thank you and I hope you will look to that as much as, and if you really are still unsure, do some really accurate surveying and we will support you. And we support the, the kids having parks, but gosh, there's a lot of parks around already. But again, Thank you, Mark, especially. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment? Any additional public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to presentations. Our first presentation is our annual audit presentation. Thank you, Mayor. I want to introduce uh, Jim Hinkle, who's with Hinkle and & Company, and they uh, did the town's audit this year. One up, Jim. Um, they'll be presenting the 2018 financial report and annual report to the board. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Paul, of course, and his staff, specifically Jeff Stone and Kim Dawson, who worked really hard on this audit and uh, do an exceptional job. And um, you know, the town has received the GFOA's Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the past 17 years, and I think their work is what shows for that. <coughs> I want to thank them. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Jim Hinkle with Hinkle & Company CPAs, and we did the annual audit of the financial statements in the uh, uh, CAFR. Uh, I believe you all have received a copy of that along with a letter. Uh, that letter is referred to as a required communication letter. I'll briefly describe that one first. Uh, we are required by our standards to communicate in writing if certain things occur in the audit. If they do not occur, then we have to communicate in writing that they did not occur. So this letter comes out whether or not there is something to communicate or not. And our letter is a clean letter. It basically states that we did not have any disagreements with management during the audit. We did not have any difficulties during the audit. We did not have to consult other accounting firms with regards to the accounting policies of the city uh, during the audit. So the, the end story is that there is nothing that we're required by our standards to communicate to the town council or the, those charged with uh, governance, as it's termed, uh, within the audit. So that was a, a, a very clean report. Uh, with respect to the audit and financial statements, I'd just like to briefly describe the process that we take. We start off uh, generally just before or after year end and do interim procedures where we review and, and document within our work the town's internal control structure with regards to the accounting and recording of financial transactions. We look at the segregation of duties uh, between the execution, the recording, and the approval of all of the transactions and we review the various systems within the organization. Uh, once we have documented the internal control structure, we then do our test of controls. So each internal control structure has various control features, such as approval of invoices, uh, documentation of the accounting codes, uh, whether they're appropriate or not. And we do a random uh, sample selection of both uh, payroll disbursements and regular disbursements. <clears throat> and we will test the control aspects of those internal control structures. We do that to be able to place a reliance upon those control structures as to the control risk being high, moderate, or low. And our goal is to reach a conclusion that the control risk or the risk of these control features failing is low. And that then uh, addresses our, the extent of our audit procedures during our final field work. All in all, we uh, did test the uh, system. We did not have any exceptions uh, in our review of internal controls. We did not find any significant deficiencies or any material weaknesses. Now, those are terms of art within our industry, 
A significant deficiency is a flaw in the design of internal controls that would allow an error to go undetected. And a material weakness is a significant deficiency that would result in a material misstatement of the annual financial statements. So to say again, our testing review, uh, came up with uh, no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal controls. Uh, we then concentrated on testing the year-end account balances, both on the uh, balance sheet of the statement of net position, as well as the uh, statement of activities and the statement of changes in fund balances, uh, or the income statement, as many refer to it. Uh, we did that through tests of uh, substantive testing, tests of detail accountants, tests of analytic review, of uh, comparing various balances to each other. What do we expect these balances to be? Is what we see what we expect? Uh, and then we inquire with management as to looking at source documents uh, or uh, discussing the changes in account balances from one year to the next. The end result of the audit is that the auditor's report is a clean opinion. It's technically referred to as an unmodified report means basically that the financial statement prepared and presented by management is in accordance with general accepted accounting principles applied on a consistent basis and is materially accurate. So all in all, it was a good audit. Uh, I would like to say thank you to the staff and to Paul and the group in the accounting department. Everything that we asked for, we were given. We weren't denied any access for anything. Uh, they were very helpful in all of the processes that we go through uh, with our staff. Uh, pulling invoices and other source documents, and uh, all in all, it uh, was a smooth process and a good, clean audit. So, any questions? Well, thank you very much for for the uh, report. Uh, it's it's always great to hear good news, and uh, so thank you. And uh, I have board questions, Ken. <clears throat> Mr. Engel, thanks for uh, being here this evening. Appreciate You're it. Can you uh, give us a little bit, uh, just background about you, your firm, and the, uh, the experience and credentials of the specific people who actually worked on this engagement? Uh, yes, uh, I've been in public accounting for, uh, boy, since 1982, um, so quite a few years. Uh, I started out of uh, uh, Kansas City in uh, a regional firm, Bear Kirsten Dobson, who's actually up here in Colorado as well. Uh, was uh, then transferred to Oklahoma, uh, where I started my own practice uh, and built up a full-service CPA firm, uh, audits of governmental entities, uh, single audits, which are audits of federal fund recipients, uh, nonprofit organizations, as well as a full-service tax department. A year and a half ago, we combined with Swan Horse and Company, uh, who has been in uh, the Colorado market for 20 years or so. Um, and uh, since then, we have uh, added the staff uh, and continued uh, the uh, audit process that's been here. We audit probably 25 plus cities uh, each year along with uh, four county audits. Uh, those are the December 31 engagements and then we also audit uh, a, a full uh, slate of uh, school districts and charter schools that are June 30 year ends that keep us busy on the uh, back half of the year. Uh, the uh, Manager on engagement was uh, Timothy, and he has uh, over 15 years of public accounting experience, uh, somewhat variety, but uh, half of that in governmental auditing or governmental entities, um, some public entities as well. And then uh, we had some staff that had some continuity with being on the audit in the past, uh, the last two years, as well as. Uh, some newer staff uh, doing some of the assistant uh, type work uh, within the audit team. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, uh, I'll comment, uh, I'm a federal auditor myself, so when you talk about single audits, <laughs> speak my language. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, as far as uh, your, your 25 cities and four counties that you mentioned, uh, are you seeing any trends specifically uh, as regard to uh, financial fraud that is impacting local governments or throughout trade publications and whatnot? Are you, are you seeing any of those trends that the town should be aware of and uh, adding additional controls to ensure we prevent? Um, <clears throat> probably across our entire client base uh, in the Midwest, um, 
we're seeing probably a little bit of an uptick in embezzlement type fraud. Um, most of that's on a smaller scale. Employees that have uh, been entrusted in small organizations with uh, lack of strong internal controls. Uh, Mr. Smith has been here for 20 years. He does everything. Um, and uh, with uh, the rise in some of the gambling uh, resources uh, in the Midwest, uh, the need for money has is, is increased. Um, we saw a little bit more probably when the economy was a little tougher, but that's loosened up a little bit and, and uh, uh, lessened. Not wide scale financial fraud, not the kind of financial fraud of intentionally misstating financial statements to make the organization look better in the financial statements. Um, just mostly probably, if anything, some small level uh, embezzlement type fraud, uh, $100,000 or less. A little bit of uptake in there, but that's primarily most of it. Okay. Uh, one of the, uh, the concerns that I have uh, just generally speaking, uh, or as I'm sure you now know, our town model relies uh, heavily on the use of uh, contractors, uh, consultants, and other outside business professionals. Um, uh, as you know, the, the area of procurement and billing uh, fraud can is, is a high area for uh, of risk. Um, can you speak to the types of testing and controls the and control testing uh, that you did in that area uh, for us and whether you had any specific concerns. And, and I realize we had an unmodified report, but if there's anything that you guys observed that we can improve, I'd appreciate it. Uh, if we did have some major concerns, it would have been reflected in the audit report or in the uh, required communication letter as uh, concerns that we would have found, so we did not. Um, from my experience in the reading and, and whatnot uh, that we've done, the procurement fraud is, is typically uh, conducted uh, with someone on the inside with uh, uh, kickbacks or something like that that to come into play where uh, a vendor will overbill uh, and having someone inside to kind of run those bills through without being uh, through the normal process uh, of the control structure, the internal control structure. and. Um, they get a kickback then personally for that. So um, I have not seen any of that in our clients. Uh, I think that the control structures that you all have in place have that segregation of duties such that that minimizes the risk of uh, that type of procurement fraud from occurring. Uh, one of the things that we do look at uh, to the extent that we can is as we do our both the testing of internal controls through the sample testing, as well as the uh, substantive testing of details. We look at the invoices, supporting documentation for what is being uh, purchased, and does that appear reasonable uh, in light of what is being uh, purchased, um, specifically also whether the goods and services have been actually received, and is there documentation that those goods and services have been received. Um, so we do look for those types of, of uh, issues during the audit processes, and nothing came to our attention that would have raised any concerns. Appreciate that. And uh, uh, one final question. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your discussion of the test of controls uh, that you do a random sample of payroll and regular disbursements. Uh, did you guys employ any type of data analytics to uh, try to find more risky transactions at all, or is it 100% random samples? Uh, the test of controls is 100% random samples. Uh, <clears throat> during the substantive testing on the year-end balances, uh, we have a software uh, program that we've moved into uh, since the, uh, the merger here in Colorado that does have a data analytics review process to it. It's not real in-depth at the moment, um, but it does look for some abnormalities uh, in the analytic review process. Uh, and, and nothing came to our attention that would have uh, required us to look further into those, any abnormalities that might have come up. Do you mind telling me which software package it is, just out of curiosity? Teammate. Okay. Part of uh, Walter Schlur's engagement. Uh, Very familiar. <laughs> we use uh, engagement along with the Knowledge Coach uh, programs, okay. the companion to that, and, uh, and then 
we we also are into the uh, the, poor, uh, the uh, work process component of that, uh, and the work stream component, which is more of a administrative side. But that teammate has both the administrative side and the data analytics to it. Okay, thank you. And uh, beyond that, Paul, great job to you and your staff. Thanks so much for the great job and working so well with the auditors while keeping up your day-to-day -day workload. Thank you. And ask great questions. I, I really enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought everybody else did, but, but I should. <laughs> oh. yeah, we, we, we felt that can ask very articulate questions. Can you shoot the audit? Okay. And, oh. and, uh, you Sorry. Your Thank you. We can, thanks. We can't have a lot of comment from the. Unless, okay, any other questions from the board? All right, great job again. All right, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next presentation is our economic development update. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Earlier this year, the town engaged Bitter City to assist the town with our economic development uh, efforts and services. Adam Hughes, the CEO of Better City, is here tonight. Thanks, Adam, for coming. Uh, to provide the board an update on regional trends, our recent ICSC conference that we went to, Mayor and I and Adam, um, activities related to Superior and um, general leads and activities in the region. Thanks. Thanks. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, there's a lot of information that I think we prepared and provided to the board, and I'll just give a kind of high-level overview if I could. And if you have any specific questions, just feel free to ask as I go through the material. Uh, but the month of April, we spent visiting the community, conducting interviews, uh, trying to gather kind of a, a base of information uh, from which we could build an understanding of the, the market and trends that are going on. And then in May, we, uh, we focused on preparing for ICSE and reaching out to a number of different companies uh, to establish uh, some meetings and relationships with them. And we also attended uh, a separate conference. It wasn't in our, our plan, but... Uh, one that we learned of that was really focused on the hotel industry. We thought it was going to be really valuable for us to attend that, gather information associated with the, uh, the market. Uh, so we did that on May 13th. And we traveled with uh, the town manager and the mayor to ICSC and visited with a number of companies there. Uh, we felt like it was a very productive uh, meeting that uh, ended up generating a couple of leads that were, were actually uh, continuing conversations with um, throughout this month. And, uh, and ongoing. So uh, we <clears throat> have some interest from uh, a couple of hotel brands that we're working with. Um, other ones that uh, are listed here, a food hall operator, uh, real estate developer, uh, recreation attraction operator, and a franchise, uh, restaurant franchisee. Uh, and shared with you some information on the hotel market. Uh, as part of the of this update we'll go into that in a lot of detail but um, we are kind of peaking in terms of the cycle for hotels nationwide uh, and the north denver market uh, does appear to have a level of stability in certain areas uh, and in others it's more challenging uh, especially when we start looking at uh, some of the specific segments in and around superior and we can get into that in more detail uh, later on if you'd like. Uh, with that, we've provided a, a work plan. This is based on uh, really the level of information that we've been able to gather to date uh, to really focus in on areas where we feel like uh, there's uh, a likelihood of some level of success uh, as well as uh, you know uh, the, the scope of work that you asked us to focus in on. So... <clears throat> In terms of the Superior Marketplace, Downtown Superior, uh, Discovery Office Park, uh, the Resolute site, as well as Colton Road, we have uh, a, a detail of uh, our, the scope of work that we're planning on executing uh, through the rest of the year. And, you know, this, I, I'd like to state that, uh, try not to think of this as something that's written in stone. This is our current work plan, but conditions do change. Uh, that may require uh, some adjustment, uh, but also if there's feedback or things that you'd like to see changed in the work plan, do let us know. Uh, we can make those adjustments accordingly. The, we have a, a more detailed uh, report on ICSC and the groups that we've met with. So we did meet with Bricksmore and spoke with them about 
redevelopment opportunities uh, at their site. They are currently exploring some relationships with uh, multifamily developers at the uh, RTD site. And uh, they wanted to advance those discussions a little bit uh, before I think really engaging about uh, uh, you know other things associated with that redevelopment. Uh, but Matt Berger with Bricksmore will be visiting the community uh, sometime later this summer and we'll, we invited him to come and present to the town board. I think that would be a, a good valuable discussion to, to have them here and hear what their plans are and what they're currently working on. So there we did um, they did share with us some level of information associated with uh, some of the tenants uh, and maybe some limitations because of those lease terms in terms of redevelopment, what would be available. Uh, they are currently working on uh, the party city space, as are we, uh, looking at uh, attracting in uh, something that would change the use pattern there uh, and create some vibrancy. And <clears throat> we also met with uh, the broker for downtown Superior and talked about uh, areas of focus associated with that development, as well as with Game Creek Holdings and the status of uh, where Tesla is. And there's there appears to be some positive momentum or at least some activity associated with that. But uh, he promised to keep us posted in terms of how that uh, how that is going. Uh, again, a lot of information in terms of uh, hotels, which I think we'll be going over a little bit more later today, later tonight. And in terms of uh, recreational vendors, I think this is a, uh, a good opportunity to try and focus on bringing in some destination attractions uh, into downtown Superior, also the Superior Marketplace. And we're continuing to have discussions with a number of these uh, different operators as well. So any, any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Just asking if we could ask questions anytime or only at the yeah. end. Um, so I really love all the research that you've done. I think it's fantastic. Um, I had a question specifically around the different, um, I'm not sure what we're calling them, the entertainment amenities or sports amenities, uh -huh. um, like the skydiving place and all of that. Um, in your opinion, is that something where we would need to we would need to do that holistically and kind of say we're going to create an overall entertainment district or is it something where we could go piecemeal um, to encourage one place at a time to come in? That's a really good question. Uh, what we're trying to look at with these, uh, so some of these are equipment manufacturers and they're not actual operators themselves. Yeah, I saw that where they yeah. said they might provide, loan the equipment for a six mm -hmm. month test and then right. go from there. So the missing piece is the, the business plan and the operator. So one of them has already provided me with a feasibility study, a high level feasibility study and pro forma that would need to be adapted to this local market. Okay. Uh, the missing piece obviously is the operator. We, we're trying to navigate through these equipment manufacturers to connect to an operator that we can then um, screen in terms of the market and the level of interest and the level of feasibility that those attractions would have. There is some level of um, synergy associated with having them co-located together, but right. then there's also the need to have each one um, be individually uh, analyzed to determine how much of a market share they can generate and whether they would be operated standalone or in conjunction with uh, other attractions mm -hmm. and so the the real key here uh, and the elements that we're going to be continuing to work on is connecting to those operators that have experience uh, operating these attractions and working with them to understand the feasibility associated with bringing something into superior so you know some of these may not be feasible uh, and, and others might be uh, but the trick is to really find out which ones are going to work and which ones might not and, and focus our efforts accordingly. In terms of attractiveness, is it generally the case that once we get one, others might be more interested in following? Um. Uh, yes and no. So I think you reach a saturation point where there's only so much in family entertainment that can go around mm -hmm. in terms of disposable income that people would be willing to spend within the surrounding region. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's part of understanding 
uh, or getting an operator to understand this market and give us their thoughts on, okay, we, we think this, this, and this would be good, but if you start adding in more, it doesn't equate to additional visitation. Right. right? Because the market gets basically tapped out mm -hmm. with supply. Okay. Great questions. Thank you. Others? Questions? Stan? Stan on the entertainment for a minute. What are... What, what are the barriers that you're seeing? What are the, what are they looking for in terms of? Um, it, it's interesting these things that have popped up, whether or not it's the trampoline or the rope courses, or there have been some conversions from these big box stores. What are some of these uh, manufacturers and then downstream the owner operators looking for, and what are the barriers you see? The top barriers that you see for us. Uh, so the one consistent ask that um, we had when we were visiting with them was what's the population within 30 minutes? And so that seems to be one of the criteria as well as household income that they're looking at a 30 minute kind of drive time or attraction or market to pull people in. So to the extent that we have competing attractions within that 30 minute drive time that would be similar in offering would limit our penetration within that market. So I think that's one of the impediments. The other is finding an operator and an, a suitable space that can accommodate that specific use and a property owner that would be willing and other anchors that would be con that would consent to have that use within a particular development. Welcome. But the other thing too that um, on that same note. There are some that are getting a lot of attention from a lot of communities, and so they understand that they have leverage and they can pick and choose where they want to go. And so that's that's another aspect to this as well, is you know, how can we position Superior in such a way where it they recognize that there's a better business case locating here than maybe in another community. Um, you know. Adam, it's good to see you again. Just um it's a couple of questions. One of them is, you know, obviously you're new to us and we're new, you know, we're reading your stuff for the first time and, and it's always a, a learning session as you try to understand someone's tone. So as I'm reading all your documents, I'm getting, you know, kind of your tone of writing and I'll be honest, it feels kind of negative and I don't know if that's by design or if in the context of what's actually happening, you're just kind of preparing us for the reality of the market's contracting. I think your attendance numbers for the ICSC is down, you know, 7,000, what is it, about 15% year over year. It's not a small contraction. Um, you know, are we at the point, did we engage you potentially too late, you know, at least for this cycle? And is it, you know, just kind of, we're just going to hunker down for the next few years, um, or grab aggressively pursue stuff for the next few years before it starts expanding again. Um, just like to get your bigger picture feel on what's happening. Cause I mean, I, this stuff's fantastic for me. Um, but you know, I read this and I, I kind of get this sad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Like, you know, did, did we miss it or is it just, you know, is there is there a light here, things that we need to be doing more aggressively? That's a really great question. I think in some cases there's, you know, specific segments in the hotel industry where you, you certainly missed it. Um, that's not to say that all hotels are out of the picture, but it just means that we need to shift focus uh, into other segments of the hotel industry. In terms of retail, what you're seeing is that retailers are really kind of just looking around, they don't really know what they need to do in order to transition their business and be successful because consumer uh, behavior is shifting underneath their feet. And there are a lot of business models that are being developed and are seeing success and traction in a lot of these centers, but they're so nascent that they haven't reached a national scale yet. And so you have to really be aggressive and get ahead of that curve. And so when these other competing centers are all looking for recreation and entertainment uses, um, if we're late to the party, then we're going to miss the boat. And I think that's the important takeaway from this is like now is the time to really get aggressive in terms of entertainment and recreation uses, because if they go somewhere else, there's not enough in the market to support another location in Superior. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I guess for that nascent market, it's really kind of helping them cross the chasm, you know, from, I mean, to turn it into a different term, you know, from early adopter to broad market in terms of adoption, um, we've got to be the ones to help them get there. Right. Really. Yeah. So for example, like Bricksmore has over 400 different locations, um, but not all of them have an entertainment and recreation use. 
Uh, but there are, you know, businesses that might have five, 10 locations. They're not in every single Bricksmore, uh, you know, center. Uh, and so they may not, they may not have heard of them. That's not on their radar screen. And in that way, we can try and help bridge that chasm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again. <clears throat> Since we're, uh, at the downtown superior uh, part of the of the work plan, can you speak to uh, just the work uh, that you've done in conjunction with the developer uh, and the broker on their side, and just help us explain the relationship that you formed with them and who's taking the lead on what and how your uh, efforts are complementing each other? Yeah, sure. So, uh, one of the things that we did was we had a kickoff call with the developer and his entire team in terms of his his brokers, his marketing team. Uh, to understand what things that we could be doing to help help them and how we could complement and not duplicate work. And so there are a couple of areas um, that uh, we really focused in on. Uh, one would be helping them uh, attract a second hotel to that pad site. The other would be in trying to find office users for them. And then third is entertainment and recreation uses. Again, it kind of gets back to that, that same statement I made earlier that there are a lot of businesses out there that are, uh, they're growing uh, they're not on the national stage and that's where a lot of kind of due diligence and research can be brought to bear to, to help the developer uh, in finding specific uses in those in those key areas and then the other is um, you know I, I think there is some level of um, um, so they have a broker that uh, is really focused on on retail and another that is really focused on office. Um, and neither one of those really span entertainment, recreation, or hospitality. And so those are specific areas that we can help add capacity, uh, uh, but also in terms of uh, identifying businesses that may be outside of the local or regional market that have um, been identified as prospects for growth. So we're finalizing our workforce and industry cluster analysis, and we'll be providing that to their office brokers, uh, including a list of um, target companies outside of Colorado to reach out to within specific uh, NICS codes uh, that have demonstrated opportunities for growth. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mark. So uh, <clears throat> Adam, good to see you, and uh, thank you. You know, I think the, the materials that you prepared here um, I'm really encouraged with what I'm seeing here. You know, the, one of the frustrations that we had previously is that we weren't getting this sort of uh, easy to use, you know, digestible, you know, reports about this is the people that we talk to, these are the, the challenges that we're facing, this is what we're seeing in certain surrounding communities, um, you know, to help us make, you know, informed decisions about what's realistic uh, for Superior, you know, where we should be kind of focusing our attention. So um, I'm really uh, pleased with what I'm seeing here. So, so good job on, on the work product. Thank you. You know, with respect to, to Bricksmore, um, you know, I think we, we really need to, you know, continue working with them um, on, on a couple of different things. Number one, obviously, we want to keep the, the tenants happy that are, that, that are there, right? That's the low-hanging fruit. We don't want to lose any Costco's or Target's or anything like that, Whole Foods. Um, with respect to the opportunities that we have, you know, I think we just need to be mindful of, and, and this is in your materials, but people are shopping differently, right? We're not going to be able to fight Amazon. People are buying, you know, all manner of goods through Amazon because everybody gets, you know, same day or next day shopping and it's just, mm -hmm. it's just easy. So, you know, we shouldn't fight that, but what you can't get on Amazon is, you know, going to these, you know, ninja gyms and experiential places. And then also you know, people aren't buying couches on Amazon. So, you know, I, th I think the, the opportunity of capitalizing on Ethan Allen now and Stickley and having a destination for furniture in the marketplace seems to me like one way to really reinvigorate the marketplace. And then also, you know, working with uh, RTD and, and, you know, whether they want to do some transit oriented development along 36 and, you know, or if Bricksmore wants to do some sort of, you know, redevelopment plan that would get some people living in the marketplace, you know, that would reinvigorate that whole, that whole area. So, um, I'm, I'm really encouraged with what I'm, I'm seeing with respect to that. I, you know, I certainly want to hear the, the rest of what you're saying. Um, you know, with respect to you know downtown Superior, I think they're very lucky to have you 
you know, in, in their corner, right? Because you're, you're just basically advocating for their support, for their success, right? right. Which is ultimately our success too. Um, I, I guess my overarching theme of what I would like to see with all of this stuff is number one, you know, being pragmatic about how retail is changing, right? So we're not going to fight Amazon, but we really want to capitalize on the things that are draw, drawing communities together, right? So co-working spaces and, you know, I like the food hall concepts. I mean, it, it, if we have things that can really, you know, kind of build community, um, now obviously it depends on if we have the population to actually support these businesses. Um, but that's to me what really makes a community successful from a retailing and you know, restaurant and bar perspective and, and, and co-working spaces I think are really taking off and are really important. And I think that's superior with the amount of people that we have who work from home. A co-working space is something that I think should be on our, our radar um, as in, in any number of different places around town, not necessarily in, in the Bricksport location or downtown Superior, but that's, that's low hanging fruit. But uh, keep up the good work. Um, I think you're doing exactly what we're hiring you to do and I'm excited to see you know, where this is going. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lasis. And we do have in there um, on our office recruitment to look for co-working sponsors. Um, so the, the developers that we've talked to, they, they would like to have a third party come in and run that co-working space rather than them building it out and, and doing the leasing themselves. So that would be part of our recruitment efforts. Okay. Anyone else? Sandy, go ahead. I just wanted to say um, thank you very much. This has been something that's been at the top of my desire list since being elected two and a half years ago is our ability to support uh, new businesses and our existing businesses. Um, so um, I read quite, I, I'm going to be honest, this was the first part of the agenda I went to because this is something that I've really wanted to have happen and I'm really pleased to see it. And one of the things that I'm most pleased to see is that you're looking at the whole community. Um, I, you know, I took you to breakfast at one of the little spots over on Colton Road and I'm really appreciative of the fact that we're not just focusing on one part of town, that we're also looking at Colton Road and Resolute and um, I really appreciate you staying focused on that because I think we've got a little gem over on Colton Road that's really in the sort of geographic center of our town. Um, the one question um, I did want to ask is have you had um, any opportunity to meet with our Superior Chamber of Commerce and any of the businesses there to any extent or is that um, something on your future agenda? Um, yeah, so um, I've met with TJ a couple times and I'm going to be coming back in two weeks on the 24th to um, present to his board uh, for a short period of time. And in talking uh, with him, what we'd like to do is we'd like to create a small little task force for businesses uh, in that market uh, place uh, and talk about some of the issues that they're facing and how we might be able to help facilitate some change in those dynamics. Uh, understanding that there are going to need to be some significant changes in that area in order for uh, a change uh, for the private sector to, to engage. Uh, and it's, there's not going to be, you know, if we want to really focus in on getting the amenities that the community wants, you know, rather than what the private sector is going to provide. I mean, if you just left it to market forces, you'd probably get a, a yoga studio, a vape shop, a tattoo parlor, things like that, that are, you know, non inventory businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the areas in this work plan that I'd, I'd like to highlight is really looking outside the box uh, for that area in terms of, um, you know, looking at programming of activities uh, as well as uh, looking at maybe engaging someone that can help with pop-up retail services to curate attractions, performances, exhibitions, and those types of things to really activate the space and kind of change the dynamics in that area. Uh, you know, you've got, I think, some, some challenges associated with ownership down there. Uh, and unless ownership changes, uh, you know, there's, or tenancy improves dramatically, there's just not the economics 
there to create some significant changes. So we kind of have to think creatively and work in collaboration with those property owners as best we can to change, it, to, to change that dynamic. Um, but that area, I think, is really unique because it, it does serve the local population, uh, whereas you know Superior and downtown are going to be, uh, to some extent, more regional. And so I think there's an opportunity to make, I think, a really kind of unique community neighborhood feel there moving forward. Great, thanks. You're welcome. One thing um, I, I, I would like to add is, you know, as we're talking with, um, you know, each of these different property owners, you know, the town is going through this creative placemaking uh, effort is to tie that in. And so as we're going through and, you know, whether it's entering into negotiations or talking about design, uh, being able to incorporate those findings, the goals and objectives that that creative placemaking group has has indicated into those economic development discussions so that we're, we're hitting the point, we're, ma we're meeting the mark there. Okay. Adam, uh, <clears throat> when, when we engage you, I had my questions of how an out-of-state consultant was going to get a handle on Superior, but I've got to say I'm, I'm extremely impressed with your ability to you know, the month of April to get on the ground here and get in front of so many people and, and get such a good handle on our community. And I saw that demonstrated in Las Vegas, you know, your ability to communicate what Superior is, what we're looking for. I mean, it was as if you'd been here for years. And <laughs> and so it, it was it was impressive <laughs> to see. I mean, the preparation for the conference was great. And, um, the you know, the quality of meetings was was uh, you know was very well executed. So thank you and your staff, and uh, and thank our staff for uh, making the right choice in, in selecting Adam and um, just yeah, uh, and just hearing the feedback from the board members on the, on your reporting. It's um, I think it's just what we've been needing. So thank you, thank you, Mayor. The only thing I I'd, I'd add is um, help. We're here to not just you're here to make us successful and the town successful but we're also here to help and so i'd say if if you know i think you're on to something on the um on the activity entertainment things particularly on some of these big box stores that are you know as we've talked about they're just it's just not going to be there at some point in the future and trying to predict that um and so it's great you've got a pipeline of a few um there's a very similar demographic uh, that down in the Stapleton area, excuse me, down in the Littleton area, um, and they successfully converted a Walmart. So I'll, I'll reach out into a activity center um, in a short amount of time. So, and the people there are, seem to be doing pretty darn well. So I think something, thinking about, I, I asked you that question around what are the barriers for activity centers I think parking is obviously an issue because you've got people that are there for two and a half hours and there's you're trying to get people in and out we're gonna have that issue for the next couple of years and down for downtown Superior but for a couple of the Bricksmore spaces I think it would be a perfect use so continue to use use the board as a whole anything you need to for us to help you be successful happy to help Thank you, Trusty Ryan, and you've been a great help so far. And and we've got a call with one of your suggested companies tomorrow, good. tomorrow afternoon. So good, good. We'll let well, you know I've how got that a, goes. I've got another one for you. So send them over. <laughs> yeah, if you guys, you know, again, like I mentioned, you know, some of these are companies that a lot of people haven't heard of. So if you guys have heard of them, let me know, and we'll try and track them down and get a hold of them. Um, and then if there's any. Uh, information or detail especially in that retail analysis that you'd like to see uh you know we can make adjustments to that as well so uh we're always open to feedback anything that you'd like to see changed in the manner in which we present that retail data as well as uh the manner of our reporting please let us know and we'll make those adjustments we did have some consumer uh data intelligence that we were going to be providing we did just get access to that data for the state of colorado on friday so I uh, expect to receive that uh, here probably within the next couple of days as well. Is that the C source? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's the C source. Beat my question. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.
right next on our agenda is the consent agenda. We have four items on the consent agenda. Someone like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, motion by Mayor Pro Tem Lisa. Second. Second by Trustee Lish. All those in favor? All right, consent agenda passes unanimous. Thank you. All right, next up on the agenda is adoption of resolutions appointing members to our committees and commissions. Thank you, Mayor. This is uh, an item that we do every June to reappoint um, existing members to our all of our advisory committees. Um, it's governed under Section 21240 of the Superior Municipal Code. Um, as always, the board has the option to appoint or not appoint any of these candidates, and um, which is why it's listed not on the consent, and e there's a resolution for each in case there is a member that um, the board does not wish to appoint. We have, um, let's see, got, four, I think, one, two, three, four, five resolutions that the board will need to approve tonight, and, unless there are any changes. Um, I have one potential change uh, with regard to the historical commission. Mm -hmm. Lindsay Flewelling had emailed the uh, whole historical commission today saying that she was not applying to continue. Oh, okay. But I do see okay. her listed in yeah, the Yeah, so we'll need to make that change then. Okay. And if she's if she's changed her mind and does want to stay on, I would certainly welcome her yeah, involvement. She's been fantastic. But. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Larry. So one by one. Yeah, let's just go one by one. If maybe the uh, committee liaisons want to kind of take, take each one, that'd be probably a good way to do this. Aces right. first. Aces. I move to approve Town Superior Resolution Number R-32, Series 2019, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior, making appointments to the Advisory Committee for Environmental Sustainability. Okay, motion by Trustee Lish. Second by Trustee Swierczynski. All those in favor? All right, passes unanimous. All right, caps. Move to approve Town of Superior Resolution Number R-33, uh, Series 2019, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior making appointments to the Cultural Arts and Public Spaces Advisory Committee. All right, motion by Trustee Ryan. Second by Trustee Shaw. All right, all those in favor? Passage unanimous. All right, next one is historical. Move to approve resolution number R34, series 2019, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior making appointments to the Superior Historical Commission. Okay, motion by Trustee Skrzynski, second by uh, Trustee Lish. All those in favor? Passes unanimous. All right, final one is ProStack. Prostec. I'm sorry, OSAC, then ProStack. <laughs> Uh, I'd make a motion for to approve Town of Superior Resolution number R-35, yes. is that right? Yes. Series 2019, <clears throat> a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior making appointments to the Open Space Advisory Committee. Okay, motion by Trustee Hammerly. Second by Trustee Lish. All those in favor? Passes unanimous. And final one is ProStack. I'd like to make a motion in Town of Superior Resolution Number R-36. Yes. Uh, series 2019, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior, Colorado, making an appointment to the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trails Advisory Committee. Okay, motion by Trustee Shaw, second by Trustee Hammerly. All those in favor? And that passes unanimous. All right, congratulations to all the uh, newly appointed and returning uh, committee members. So. You're appointed. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Our next on our agenda is number five, adoption of a resolution approving an agreement with Da Vinci Signs to furnish and install the town monument sign. Thanks, Mayor Martin. We'll introduce this item. Yes, thank you. Uh,
Good evening, Martin Toth, Town Staff. I'll try and introduce a little bit about this project and how we got to this proposal. And then Emily Clapper on our staff and also Rodney Eaton from Da Vinci Signs are here. They can help answer questions that I won't be able to. Uh, and then Rodney's here to talk a little bit about fabrication and the technical questions of what the sign involves, if you have any questions about that. So uh, this is a topic that's come up before, and the town, the town board has looked at monument signs um, in previous times over the years. Um, having this type of boundary marker has become fairly common in municipalities across our region, and it's an item that the board included through the, 19, the 2019 budget approval process. For residents who might be watching and are unfamiliar with this project, staff started working last year with Da Vinci to develop some initial design ideas for the, the board to look at during a retreat session last year. It was about a year ago this time. With this feedback from the board, staff then worked with the vendor to revise these options. Then the CAPS committee, the Cultural Arts and Public Spaces Committee, had a chance to review these updated designs last fall. Based on that dialogue, we worked with Da Vinci and their staff to finalize the current design details for this agreement that you have tonight. We tried to do this in conjunction with the pedestals that are being fabricated and going into the McCaslin roundabout for the art installation. The point there was just to make sure that they're complementary, that they're not something that's in too much of a stark, stark contrast and has some common texture between the two. So with the presentation that's in your media materials tonight, the proprietary design that um, the Da Vinci staff put together uh, has been, and they developed is shown here on screen. The first design is designed for the median and McCaslin at the Highway 36 interchange. We tried to show it um, in context with what, it, what it'll look like when it was actually installed with this photo sim. And then on the next page, it has the schematic detail, uh, with a little bit more of the detail showing where the, how the, the sign is actually shaped, and it shows an image of the nighttime view with the town's burgundy red color internal lighting showing through as an accent. Uh, so this is a little bit more detail for that initial sign. So this would be the first of the three signs that would be installed. The other two are shown on the next two slides. Second one would be Col uh, Colden, uh, east of Tyler, just on the superior side of the boundary with Broomfield. This sign would be roughly the same size as the sign at 36 in McCaslin, except as you can see, it's turned horizontally. And with this distance, from the roadway, the sign's a little easier to see, and the lettering can be a little larger uh, with this orientation. And then next is the third sign at Highway 128 in McCaslin in the south end of town. This sign's obviously a little larger because uh, it's gonna be set back a fair distance from the, from the roadway. So this was a 20 foot sign as opposed to 12 feet for the, other, the first two signs. So those are, the, those are the designs that we've been working on since last year. Uh, this is the second time the board's had a chance to see them after getting some feedback from uh, CAPS committee. Budget information is listed in the cover memo, as you can see. Staff's proposing to install the first sign this year for about $36,000, and then budget for the next two signs over the next two budget cycles. Timing-wise, if the board uh, chooses to approve this agreement, um, Da Vinci will start fabricating immediately, and it should be done sometime in the middle, sometime in August for installation. So those are the three signs. Uh, trying to incorporate the feedback that we heard from the board over last year and the CAPS committee. And then Emily and Rodney are here to help answer any technical questions you have. Okay, thanks, Martin. Questions? Okay. Martin, thank you. Um, I think these signs look great. Um, I was really happy when we looked at them last year or before the, the new board was on the board and we looked at it with the, the previous board. Um, I think that these are long overdue and it's going to be a great addition to our town. Um, my two questions slash comments, uh, as to the first sign uh, to be located at the Diverging Diamond, um, just looking at the photo that was included in the packet, I was a little concerned about the location of that sign and if it's going to be kind of hidden a little bit behind the, you know, kind of the, the arching, uh, uh, steel structure that holds the actual signs for US 36 West, Boulder, and then McCaslin North. So I wouldn't want us to locate it somewhere and then all of a sudden have it not be something that people see because it's actually blocked by that structure. So I don't know if that's just based on how it's appearing in this, this photo, but I, I feel like if you're traveling in the left lane on the diverging diamond, you, you might not see it. So I just want us to be mindful as to where the location is going to go because I wouldn't want us to spend a bunch of money on a beautiful sign and then have it be obstructed by one of the traffic uh, 
uh, signs. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, we've had a chance to go out there a couple of times and tried getting a photo roughly showing where it would make sense. We've looked at a couple of different locations in that median itself, trying to gauge where it would make sense. You're right, there's the overhead sign from the, the highway is a little bit of an impediment, but with the braided note, the, the braided motion of the traffic going through there, we'll find the right place. There's, there's a couple of things in the median that uh, we'll work around to make sure it's in the most visible place. But just with the flow of traffic, this is a, a really good crossroads for it to be spotted. Okay. And then uh, the second question slash comment that I have is, you know, we've been talking about these three signs now for a while, and is there a reason why we're just going forward with one? I, I would personally be supportive of going forward with all three and let's just get this done and then not have to consider this again in the future. Well, I'll jump in if that's a question for me. <laughs> yeah. you know, obviously, we like to move forward with all of them all at once. When we went through the budget process last year, trying to find a way that made, made sense with the larger context of the budget, it made sense to try and stagger it over a couple of years. And so this was our first attempt to try and put something together that obviously first met the design requirements the board was looking for. And then if there's a way to find a way to, to, to budget to do, to do it earlier, that'd be great also. Yeah, I mean, per personally, you know, I. I I'd be supportive of going forward with all three, so we don't have to consider this again in the future meeting if we're, if we're supportive of the design the new board likes, kind of the direction that the old board was going in, and let's see if we can find the money somewhere. I'm sure there, there's always a, a way um, to be creative with how we're executing on the budget that was approved last fall. So those are my comments. I I would be in support of also pulling it forward. I'd like to see, though, if we do that, if there's any possibility to um, get a better kind of package on pricing from Da Vinci Sons. I know, you, I know you guys all look into that, but. Yes, we will. Thank you. Yeah, I think the comment that I was going to ask was, with us doing this over three years, do we feel like these prices would hold? at what you've projected them at over the next two years. Um, you know, do we have any sort of a guarantee that's what they were? I was kind of hoping you would say, no, we have no guarantee. So then it would make it easier for me to build the case to say, I would really like to see us go ahead and do all three of them. You know, the, the one thing is the one we're going to put in first is the one where it's kind of the most obvious that you're coming into Superior. And yet the locations we're doing further out are the ones that are least obvious when you're coming into Superior. So I kind of went, well, why are we doing this this way? Why aren't we doing the other two locations? And I'm sure you just at random pick those, but um, I really support what Mark said. And um, if we could do all three of them this year, where is Paul when you need him? <laughs> um, well, when it comes but, to spending more money, we can answer for Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would really like to see us go ahead and move forward with this. This has been something I've really wanted to see us do for several years. So. And I think they look great. Sure. Uh, thank you, Trustee Hammerly. In answer to your first question, I don't need to ask Rodney to come up and answer. I, I don't think he can guarantee a price next year, uh, this year. No, I can't. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. I'm sorry. Uh, no, materials change. Uh, you, you might come in. Rodney, up. if you got to take your Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, we had talked about that actually at length to discuss whether we could package everything for you over a period of time, but we have been experiencing some huge swings in material pricing, uh, concrete, um, you know, general contracting for, I'm sure you guys have seen this too in some of the budgets you put together for things that are going on within the community now. So it's very difficult to put anything that lasts more than about 60 days. And even that can be a stretch sometimes. We were seeing aluminum change within 48 hours and, and in big swings. So, yeah. Um, we worked together pretty closely. Emily has done a, an amazing job keeping this all together and, and coming in and letting me come in and speak to the other committees and talk about, you know, how the signs are going to place. And the placement of that sign may look a little bit interesting at the moment but i think if you were standing out there where we were standing your your flow of traffic is sees it very very well especially incoming traffic into the town it's very <laughs> visible um and with the 12 foot height i think we're in a really good spot right there 
Great, thank you for that comments. Um, I can't wait to see the, the red backlighting. That just <laughs> looks really, really cool. And I think they're, uh, I think they're very well, well designed. And uh, thank you. And uh, and I'm also supportive of just getting them all done. If we can find a way to get this done um, all in one package, I think it makes a lot of sense. And and it will just give continuity as people drive around. They'll see all three and like, wow, okay, they're all done at the same time. I think doing them uh, over the years. Um, yeah, be less optimal. So, yeah. Whatever I can do to help. So, uh, so whatever you can do to help, ask the question, what kind of discount would we get if we made the decision this evening for all three? Well, I can guarantee the price I've given you already. That's so there'd be sure. no, for the, for the bundling of all three, no further? It's not that I can't give you discounts. It's that we pressed to get to a lower number on what we had originally. So when we originally designed the signs, we didn't really have a, an exact budget in mind. Um, more of a design to, to get something that the city would really enjoy and like and made sense to what else was going on. Um, and the designs we came up with were extremely expensive. Um, and so we had to really narrow that down to where we're at now. And so we worked extremely hard at getting these numbers discounted to where they're at now. So it's not a matter of could I do anything more? I think we've kind of gotten to a point where we can't go any deeper than we have already without changing the way the sign has been built again, basically. And it's a fair question. I would love to be able to say yes, but that would just mean I'd have to inflate my price just to take it back down, and that's not how I operate. Thank you. Sure. Ken. I, uh, I ran out of time to do my, uh, my research prior to this meeting, so uh, maybe a question for town staff. Uh, these three locations, uh, were these uh, selected purely off traffic volume? Uh, what, what were the, the factors? Because I was surprised uh, not to see 88th as one of the locations for a possible sign. Yeah, 88th is just a difficult location. I mean, that was looked at. It's just a difficult location with the bridge there and the future possible intersection that's going to occur there. Um, you know, maybe at some point in the future, after the road's been improved, um, we can look at something. But at this time, it's okay. just too many un unknowns right now for that entry point. That's valid. <clears throat> uh, and then not really a, a question, but maybe a comment and preference. Uh, I, I am a little concerned about the burgundy red and the way it might come out uh, at night. Uh, I don't know how many of you Actually, I'm sure all of you have been to the airport and seen the glowing red eyes of uh, the airport stallion. Uh, I am seeing reminiscent same colors. I, I don't know if that's really what we're going for. Uh, I understand the, the tie to our, our town colors, but I don't know, my preference would be more to see uh, LEDs that can maybe flow from various different colors. That way it's more artistic rather than uh, just a homage to our own colors that in my mind are a gamble as to whether it could actually turn out the way we want it to. Uh, just throwing that out there to the board. Preferences? We had a uh, flowing color <laughs> mishap <laughs> once already with a certain light box in town. So I think a solid color would be a, whatever that color is, would be a safer bet. The, the Starbucks box um, was, um, is now turned off because of, it just didn't work. It, it, it worked for a it little worked, bit. It worked. It just didn't work. <laughs> but they, I saw him in Las Vegas, and he promises to get it working again. So I remember um, in a CAPS meeting, there was some discussion of what color it should be. I can't recall the exact discussion, but I do know that it was intentional, and they were happy with that color. Yeah, I, so we, we did have some discussion about it and I both at the board level and at CAPS and I, I tend to defer most decisions to the committee structure particularly aesthetic decisions I think if we have a committee who is uh, has some expertise around that so I appreciate the comment I think we I think we've got some confidence that this is going to work so. I, I really like the red uh, and 
I'm also a big fan of Lucifer over at BIA. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I think, I think that one of the things that we need to do as a community is figure out ways of, of making ourselves unique and distinguishing ourselves. And that's what the whole purpose of CAPS and placemaking. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm going to defer to artists like yourself and you know, craftsmen and, and CAPS who are, you know, looking long and hard at this. Um, but I, I think, you know, Evil Red's going to be great. <laughs> just a quick comment um so i attended a caps meeting back in october and i really thought the three of these worked together as a trio and i was going to come in here and say we needed to do all three at the same time so i'm glad to hear that the board already decided that um, i just a question on the other two because it wasn't in the packet and my, my memory doesn't go back to october very well the other two are lighted as well and it's just on the top right okay because um, i mean and I actually think the other two, just given the amount of light at the DDI in, at night, you're just not going to see the red. It's you know blazingly bright over here at nighttime. The other two, I think, are going to look really good with where they're located, because um, you know up on 128, it's dark, um, and the red actually, if anything else, for people that want to go out and see meteors, the red's probably better anyways, um, just in terms of you know light pollution. And I think the one on Tyler, I think the red will look great. So overall, I'm really happy with this. Um, I mentioned just I'm going to throw this out there because on the floor I mentioned to my parents a few days ago that you know board's going to vote on this and you know these signs they're like oh is it gonna be a horse uh, no um so and they've lived here for 20 years so I think these are a great addition to the town so thank you so point of uh clarification for for Kendra you know we're, we're talking it seems like there's general consensus about going forward with all three obviously that's not in the agreement before the board so we could approve tonight. Do you have enough direction to, you know, put together kind of a, an addendum to this agreement for us to consider in the future to uh, get the second and third monument signs put together, assuming that Paul can look at the budget and figure out, you know, yeah, how to pull money you, from something. My pr suggestion is you prove the one tonight and then we'll come back with another one, just because we don't have, we don't have an amount. Right. We have estimated amounts right now, but we don't. Right now, it's a it's a very specific contract for a specific amount. In order to change that tonight, we'd have to know the amount, you know, and put that in there. So we could do that if we had the amount. But I think what we can do is approve this tonight, and then, like you said, do an addendum to add the additional amounts at the next meeting. If that works. So point of, point of clarification for um, for Da Vinci, in terms of putting all of these signs on your. Your workload. Uh, how long would it, it, it? Assuming that we we went forward and approved all three, right now, even though we can't do that because we've got the agreement that's before us. How long would it take you to actually uh, fabricate and install all three? Um, typically, manufacturing for us will take somewhere around six to eight weeks. Um, pressing this, maybe eight to ten, somewhere in that range. Per sign, or no, total? for all three. Okay. Yeah, for all three. So. Um, you know, it could ebb and flow a week or two, one way or the other, just depending on install timing and, and of course, weather and co Colorado's cooperation. Um, but uh, yet, yeah, I think all could be done within that time frame. So. And what what sorts of uh, warranties does the town get on the quality of the material? So you get a full one year warranty on the sign from Da Vinci, a bumper to bumper, if you will. Um, the LEDs themselves have a, a longer life, so they have a longer warranty through the manufacturer. Um, typically, that runs about five years. They don't cover you, you know, someone coming out and doing the removal and reinstall, but they cover the parts portion of it. Um, we do have an option to do maintenance on the signs as well. It's not something that we've discussed, but um, we could work into a possible maintenance agreement to maintain the signs, which would mean three times a year cleaning them you know, maintaining if anything goes down, we just come out and fix it type of situation. Um, a lot of times cities like that option and they can budget it in and it works well. So it's something I can certainly look into should it, should it arise as a need. Um, but again, the full year warranty will take care of anything. Okay, thank you. You bet. Okay, ready to proceed? I'll make a motion. Okay. Uh, Town of Superior Resolution Number R-37. Yes. Series 2019, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior approving an agreement with Da Vinci Sign Systems to furnish and install the Town Monument Sign. Okay. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Laces. 
Second by Trustee Hammerly, and roll call vote. Places? Yes. Hammerly? Yes. Folsom? Yes. Wish? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Kwasinski? Yes. All right, thank you. Motion passes unanimous. And we'll look for the follow-up agreement at the next meeting. All right. That concludes our regular meeting uh, items. We do have executive session up next, so we will need to excuse the remaining audience. Thank you for attending tonight and uh, appreciate your interest. Thank you. We appreciate it. Should we take a five minute break now? Yeah, we should take a break before we have the motion. Okay. That's best. Thank you. All right. Yes. All right. Five minute break. Because, well, then we're not in taking a break. It's much right. better yeah. to not be in. All right. Break. So thank five you. minute recess. <laughs> <laughs>